In the natural world, we're also concerned with Saturday, May the 9th. Saturday, May the 9th is an occasion that is known as World Migratory Bird Day. We used to call it International Migratory Bird Day, or IMBD. We have some birds that live in the United States who spend part of the year in Canada, part of the year in the United States, some birds that spend part of their year here, and others in the Caribbean, Central America, and even South America. So birds have that opportunity to move quite a lot. We know many of them do fly, and the fact that they fly means they can cover territories. A lot of it, as a matter of fact. One of the really cool things about birds moving about, by monitoring the population of different birds, we have the opportunity to find out if something anywhere along their territory has changed that's causing a problem. When we start looking at the numbers, if the numbers of bird populations go down, that could tell us any number of things. It could indicate something has happened with their nesting locations. It could indicate something's happening with their food supply. It could indicate somehow or another an odd predator that's not normally around is out in the environment. That may be a house cat, it may be something else. That being said, we refer to birds <clears throat> as indicator species. They indicate lots of things about the environment. So studying birds and actually helping to take censuses of them, count them, report those findings, is really important because it tells us a lot about how healthy planet Earth is. So. We're uh, not going to look at too many um, of the migratory birds today. This is kind of an introductory step in some tricks in how to identify some of the birds you can find in your backyard. Anyhow, you'll notice behind me, I happen to have a feeder station set up. And we're going to take a closer look at that in just a few minutes at some of the birds that come here. There are several tools of the trade that are really important for helping us, you and I, actually observe birds. Uh, sometimes our eyes need a little help, so I have several uh, tools that I've used over the years. This is uh, a little itty bitty pair of binoculars, and I show these. These are extremely well worn. I've used them for years. At one point they had a rubber grip that was on the outside. That's long gone. If you look through the lenses, they're full of sand from being out on the beach. Binoculars are great, Good eyes are better, and I'll explain why in a moment. This one is a tiny little pocket telescope that pops out, so if you're looking at something a long way away, it'll help bring it closer so you can get a better view of what it really looks like. I will say this here, and this was told to me by Dr. James F. Parnell, professor of ornithology at University of North Carolina at Wilmington. If you can't spot it with your unaided eye, just looking at it, you probably won't be able to find it with a pair of binoculars or a little telescope. So sometimes it has to be sitting still in order to identify it. Here, in my neighborhood, a lot of the birds don't sit still. The other tool that we use quite a lot is our textbook. Remember, I said early on that being a naturalist means we're a student of natural history, and this is one of my textbooks. This is the uh, National Geographic Guide to Birds. Uh, for years I used a book called The Golden Guide to Birds. They're both organized the same way. They use paintings and ideal pictures of birds, uh, but they're organized in what scientists would call taxonomic order. So they're done in a particular order. If you happen to pick up the uh, Audubon uh, book, uh, Field Guide to Birds, that one is useful for a lot of people because it's organized by colors. The problem is sometimes birds change colors. You'll see in a little bit. Cardinals come in different colors. Males typically are bright red with the black around their bill. Females not quite so vibrantly colored. So without further ado, and I'll tell you more about how you can record your uh, findings, but without further ado, I'm gonna crawl behind the camera and we're gonna take an extended look at my feeders here. So stick with me and pay attention. We're gonna take a look at about five or six of the local guys that come here all the time. By the way, I mentioned not many of these are migratory. Mo migratory basically means they fly from place to place. They have different living places in the summer, 
different living places in the winter, different seasonal living conditions. Most of the birds we're going to see today are year-round residents that are found right here in central North Carolina. And I will give you a few tips along the way, both as far as physical characteristics and behavior that can help you identify those. It's no real surprise that our first visitor that feeders this afternoon is the Northern Cardinal. These guys are not migratory. They're found here year round, easily recognized every time there's an official bird count. This is the number one most commonly spotted bird. They're all red except for the black face, the males anyway, and they happen to have that crest. Red crested bird, chances are it's a cardinal. So those are one of the things. If you look around their bill, they have that, that nice black patch of feathers and they got this really thick bill that's designed for seed cracking. Now they're not the only ones, but we'll take a look at others in just a second. Our next visitor this afternoon is the house finch. These guys look a little bit like purple finches, but they have less red on them. It's more of a magenta color. They have more of a grayish uh, rear end, but they have that nice stout seed cracking bill. We'll look at them again in just a moment when we talk about behavior. When observing birds at a feeder, looking for behaviors will give you a good tip as to what type or what kind of bird it is. In this particular case, we have two house finches that don't mind eating around other birds. Finches are what are called gregarious. They like to be in groups and in just a moment you'll see our buddy the Cardinal pop right back up. Stay with me. I'm going to introduce you to a behavior in a moment so unique that when you see it, there is no mistaking what kind of bird belongs to this behavior. I had mentioned behaviors talking about the house finches, but let's go back to those physical characteristics that help us identify a bird. This little gray bird is a tufted titmouse. You'll look, he has a crest of feathers on the top of his head. Not unlike the cardinals, not unlike blue jays, but you'll hear those guys in the distance. Blue jays are the largest of the crested uh, birds that are common around uh, central North Carolina. These guys are one of the smallest. They've got a nice seed cracking bill. They love to come around year round. They're here in the winter time. They're also here in the summertime. So again, crest on the head, gray bird, Sometimes you'll see a little patch of pink feathers, tufted titmouse. This little guy is a Carolina chickadee. Easy to spot, he's small, he's quick, but he's got a nice black cap. And I'll call it a black sole patch. We call it a bib or a throat patch from time to time. He's a year-round resident as well. You see him a lot in the wintertime because that coloration shows up in the snow. Get ready for this, but look fast. Here it comes. Here he is, walking down the feeder with his head down. If you ever see a little bird walking down a tree trunk or a feeder with their head down instead of flying to get to a lower spot, that's a nuthatch. In this case, this one's a white-breasted nuthatch. I know, it came by very, very quickly. It's hard sometimes to catch these guys. They move around quite a lot. Which is why I mentioned the fact that if you can't spot it with your unaided eyes, sometimes it's really hard to catch them but with a pair of binoculars or a telescope or even a camera lens. So that makes it a big challenge. So those are just some of the behaviors and things that help us identify some of the common resident birds. Some of them are summertime, some of them are wintertime. Unfortunately, when we happen to have feeders, we also get uh, unexpected guests, like this young man right here. Stick around, I will show you exactly how you can log these if you want to make this more of an ongoing hobby. Well, I hope you didn't mind my uh, little side trip there dedicated to the squirrels. Uh, we have an amazing number of them here in my neighborhood, and they love it when I fill up the bird feeders and they can actually get out here and grab, I won't even call it a snack, it's a main meal for a lot of these guys. So bird watching. We actually not only want to look at the birds, but what we hope is to be able to log how many we see. 
And there's a great organization that keeps documented evidence about populations of birds, where they show up, when they show up, and in how many, well, the numbers. And this is the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that's headquartered out of Ithaca, New York. They have a website and uh, that they have several, actually, websites that can be used for education to help you identify things. And also, there is a whole census form that's used year-round. Long time ago, this was only open during seasonal bird counts. Christmas bird count, great backyard bird count in February, the Mother's Day bird count, which is the World Migratory Bird Day. Now, the website stays open all the time. You can go in, set up your account, log your information anytime you like. I will show you the web address for that as we close this particular segment out. So I'll actually have a slide from, the, uh, from their web page. What's really great about this is you don't have to be able to identify every bird. You're asked about that. You don't have to uh, be an expert. It's actually, there's a question in their uh, form that says, rate your skill. You can say you're a beginner. You can say you're an expert. You make the call. The other thing that's really great about this is this is documentation that's stored over a long period of time. So we can get what's called a longitudinal view of the populations of these animals. Again, what we're looking for is increases or declines, and we're trying to figure out, after we get that information, what are the causes of those changes in the populations. So again, bird watching is really a cool thing. So bird watching is important. What Cornell does is it gives us a place to record what we find. It's a long-term, ongoing census that helps us monitor populations of birds, and by monitoring populations of birds, we're able to monitor conditions in the environment that are either positive or negative. So, in just a moment, I'll show you their homepage. For The Neighborhood Naturalist, I'm Mr. Bob. Thanks for joining me today. Hope you have a great Mother's Day weekend. Take care.